Section 5.4. We're talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus in this section. But what we have to do is we have to start with this idea of the evaluation theorem. Now depending on your background in calculus, your Calc 1 background, you may have just played with this a little bit or you may have done this plus some extra that we're going to kind of go back through anyway. So just so we're all starting on the same page here, the first thing we need to remind ourselves of is this thing called the evaluation theorem, which maybe you've, you know, used this wording, maybe not. It's okay if, you know, you haven't, that's fine. Here's the idea. You have an integral, right? The integral of little f of x from a to b. What many of us have already learned is, oh, okay, I know how to solve this. You give me two numbers here in a and b, right? I solve this by doing the antiderivative of little f, which we often call big F. So the antiderivative. Anti, you just think of meaning opposite. All right? So take the antiderivative, plug in B minus plug in A. You know, we're going to use this over and over and over again in this course still. You've already used it in Calc 1, we're going to use it again. But, the, you know, this is kind of a, a very important piece that we're going to start off to having to remember. And so let's just kind of get a, an example of this going in here. So, you know, let me pick a nice little color to start. Purple's my favorite, so we're going to use a lot of purple. So what, what's an example of this that you might have seen? Well, let's do the integral from 1 to 2, okay, of, and what function? You know, there's maybe some of you have gone kind of deep into this and seen the many functions and their antiderivatives. Uh, we'll do a couple examples here. Maybe you haven't seen too many. So let's start with x squared dx. Okay, so how do I solve this integral? Well, the evaluation theorem says, oh, it's nothing. You just figure out, okay, what's the function big F? So this is the function I'm looking for here. What is this big F of x such that when I do the derivative of this, I get to x squared? So it's, it's setting up a formula and you're, and you're asking, well, what's the function I have to plug in so that when I do a derivative, I get to x squared? Right? So this is how we're going to you know, think of a, some of these integrals that we need to learn, of, uh, learn how to solve. This is one way to do it, is to just go backwards. Like, oh, we remember derivatives. Well, an integral uses the antiderivative. So just, you know, you go backwards. So, okay, I need to start with a function when I take its derivative, I get to x squared, right? So if we remember how these, uh, these powers work, right? What function do I need to start? What power up here gets me down to a two power here, right? And this is doing the derivative. Well, if I remember correctly, this has to be a three because what does the derivative do to the power? The derivative, remember, drops it down one, right? Three minus one is two. So that's just trying to remind you of some of these derivative ideas. But then we have to remember, you know, okay, well, well, that's not the whole process, right? What was the whole process? Well, the whole process was what? We took the number up here, right, the 3, drop it in front, then subtract 1. All right, so that's derivative. x cubed gets to this. Okay. But we're close. We've got this x squared. Hooray. We're feeling pretty good. But uh, we've got this 3 here. And if I go down here, I don't see a 3. So ooh, what are we going to do? Well, I want to not have that 3 being multiplied. So i got to figure out something to put in at the start here that will cancel with this 3. I've got this 3 at the end. I don't want this. How could I get rid of this? Well, it's being multiplied, right? So what's the opposite of that? Divide. If, if I had a 3 on the bottom here, these would cancel, and I would just be left with x squared right, because they've canceled the one. Mathematicians are lazy, one times a number, it's just that number, don't write the one anymore. So I just need some three on the bottom here. Well, you might think like, well, okay, well, how do you do that? Well, just do it, right? So what if I do this? Start with this function, take the derivative, just practice, take the derivative, drop the three down, oh, that's three over three, good. Subtract one up here, x squared, okay, well, there you go. The threes cancel, you're left with x squared. So this is equal to one third x cubed. 
And then notation that, you know, again, this might be have been a while since you've done this. The notation we use when we're using this theorem before we plug in is we draw this vertical line here, and we put our A, and we put our B here. And this is telling us, once we have this vertical line, I've done the antiderivative. Stop with the antiderivatives. All that is left is to plug in. Okay? So then you just do it using this theorem. Take B first, that's the top number, plug it in. So 1 third, 2 cubed, because I'm plugging the 2 in here, minus 1 third, okay, and then 1 cubed. That's the evaluation theorem, right? You take the antiderivative, which, remember, we have rules for this, just kind of trying to remind you how we kind of thought through some of these rules. But there are rules for doing these, these integrals. Uh, and so I'll remind you of what this rule is for x squared. Uh, and we'll learn more rules for more functions uh, as we go through, right? But, you know, that, that's the whole idea. You take the antiderivative, which was just answering this question. What function, when I take its derivative, gets to x squared? We found that was 1 third x cubed and then you plug the bounds in and subtract between them. Okay, so that's, let's do that out. That's 8 thirds minus 1 third, which is 7 thirds. Boom. All right, so just to remind you, evaluation theorem. You're gonna get your antiderivative, you're gonna plug in. Boom, done, okay? And so, you know, this is something that you, you might have to review. You might have to go back and do a little review of, is thinking through all these antiderivatives. So, you know, just to kind of remind you of a couple of them that are, are more common, right? So if, we're, if, we're, if we have some function here, f of x, and then we want to also talk about the antiderivative, big F of x. This is the antiderivative. So the go backwards, right? Okay, well, we just did this example, x to the n. Now, can you look at this, and this is an important thing to be able to do when you're in a math class and you're thinking about these things, and you're trying to find the new pattern. Well, what did we do? We went 2 to 3, okay? 2 to 3, so that's add 1 to the power. And then what did we do? This 3 actually popped up again, right, on the bottom. So that would be divide by n plus 1. And here you go. That's our antiderivative rule. Add 1 to the power, divide by that number. Boom. Now, you got to be a little careful here. Like that, that, remember, when we're doing derivatives, x to the power n, we were just, oh, this is no problem. Great, great, great. You know, except for we do have one issue here. And the one issue is we're dividing by a number. So we've really got to make sure that number's not 0. But it could be, right? Think about this. n plus 1 could be 0 if n is negative 1. And this isn't going to make any sense, right? If I try this, I'm going to get 1 over 0. That doesn't make any sense. So this only is true. So this this like little kind of, you know, pattern we found here, this formula is only true, so this is this line is true if n is not negative 1. If n is negative 1, we need something else. It doesn't work. But if n, if n is not negative 1, we're, we're good here. So some other ones that we want to remember, uh, we've got cosine and sine. These are, you know, very common for us to go through. Right? And so we just got to remember, what function, when I take the derivative, that's this, when I take the derivative, do I get cosine out? That's sine. When I do the derivative of sine, I get cosine. Okay? Well, what function do I take the derivative of to get sine? Well, remember, they just go back and forth. Except the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is an example kind of like of above where I've got to throw that additional negative in to counterbalance because I don't have a negative here. What gets rid of a negative? Another negative. You know, there's a, a few other ones that, you know, we can kind of go through. Um, for example, uh, secant squared and tangent. So the derivative of tan is secant squared. 
So then I know the antiderivative of secant squared, it's tan, right? I can, I can kind of go back and forth here. Um, and, you know, there's some more that you might have played with when you learned about antiderivatives the first time. But, and we're going to just spend a good amount of this course adding to this list of functions we can find the antiderivative of. But these are a couple that are pretty useful to have uh, in your back pocket as we go through. So, you know, that, that's the evaluation theorem. You give me a function in an integral here. It's not too bad. I find the antiderivative. I plug the bounds in. Boom. Good to go. All right. So we need that for the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's very important. So let's go down and get to this fundamental theorem. And so the way that this, this is going to work, this document is going to work, is... I'm going to take pieces of the book. So this is in the book, and I'm going to show you how one can go through it. All right, and so talk it over, kind of think it through, but this is trying to get you to see a model of what it's like to read something like this because there is a lot of information packed in here. So let's just read this first thing. We'll read it once through, and then we'll dig in. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 1. If f is, a conti if f is continuous on some interval a to b. Remember, a to b are just numbers, right? Every time you see this, you should just think numbers. Then the function g defined by g of x is an integral from a, again, a number, to x. This is no longer a number. It's now a variable. So keep that in mind. Of f of t dt is defined between a and b. So telling you where the domain of this function is, right? This is telling me, where can I even do this? Which is connected up here. So it's defined by that integral. That is actually an antiderivative of f. And that f is given here. The derivative of g is f on this domain here. So what are we saying here? Basically what we're saying is, look what I can do. I can make a new function out of an integral. Create a whole new function, g of x here, right? By basically accumulating this f of t. This is sometimes called an accumulation function. And the way you can think of this, it's pretty interesting the way this works is you can think of this f of t function as representing change. Often people like thinking speed, velocity. That's the kind of like common, how do I think about this in real terms? Okay. So if you think of, of this function f as your speed, like being in a car or running, whatever you want to do, however you want to transport yourself. So if this function somehow is showing you speed, then how do I take that and, and get something useful out of it in terms of where I am, right? I know how a car is moving over some time period. So what? What does that tell me? Well, this theorem is telling you that if you know how a car is changing speed over time, you can actually construct its position over time. That's what this theorem says. It's it's really, it seems on the face of it like it's like, oh yeah, sure. It's really a fundamental, I mean, it says fundamental in the name, right? So I guess I'm not giving you anything new. But it's really a very deep idea. Really think about what this means. Knowing how something changes over time, this construction gives us a way to perfectly, out of that information, construct where the thing is over time. That's just this one example of how x, t, g, and f are, are working. We can think of other ways and scenarios in life where we could apply this, and it's still just as useful. But for now, just the change in speed. How something changes, if I only think about this, I'm only focusing on the change of something. I can construct the state of that thing only with its change. That's what this is saying. This is an immensely powerful idea. Just accumulating change. 
oh, you changed a little bit more. Okay, let me add that in. You changed more. Let me add that in. You changed more. Let me add that in. I just have that information. I can construct and tell you a ton about that thing by only focusing on how did you change? How did you change? How did you change? That's what this is telling me. That's what this setup is. I'm going to remember integral, integral, add up. That's a, that's a great way to think of the integral is a way of kind of adding things. What are you adding? You're basically just adding the change. Add the change, add the change, add the change. I can now reconstruct a function that tells me about this thing that's changing by only focusing on the change itself. So pretty crazy idea actually when you really dig into it. Uh, and, and that's really what the focus of, of this section is. And it's kind of got two pieces to it. We'll start with the first piece, which is really trying to dig into how this F and G play together. Because what you'll see is we often have F. We will often, often, often be given F as a function, a graph. And we'll want to be able to reconstruct G, learn about G, tell me everything you know about G. And you'll see we can actually know a ton about this function G just by looking at f, not even calculating the integral necessarily, just looking at f. It's kind of crazy. You'll see kind of how deep we can go with this, right? And it's going to use the evaluation theorem. So I'm going to actually start you off with kind of a little crazier example here. So here's the function f of t is sine of pi times t squared over 2. So all this is done in Mathematica. Um, you can have the, the, the Mathematica notebook. It'll be posted for you to play around with. Um, so you have all that to, to mess around with, and that will be available. So OK, let's stop and go like, all right, what's going on here? So we got a function, sine. You see how it's bouncing all up and down? That's sine-ish. But it doesn't look exactly like sine. That's what this t squared is, is doing in, in here. right? It's changing some stuff up. But it's bouncing like a sine curve kind of does. So all right, OK, that's fine. It's a little bit weird. Kind of looks symmetric. OK, so those are some things you could just think of looking at this. So that's cool. But you know, how does this connect to this theorem we just talked about? right? Because this is the whole point. Well, what we can do is we can define a new function g of x by taking the integral of this function, this picture here, over a certain range. Okay, So let's think about this, and, and let's write this down. Or maybe we'll do it down here. So what are we saying here? So we're saying g of x is going to be the integral. Now, before I even write any more, here is a helpful tidbit in all of your future math courses and everything. You get a theorem like this. I know I picked a kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more confusing function here to start with. But whenever you're first trying to understand something like this, make it as simple as possible. So what do I mean by that? Look at the way this is defined. I'm doing g of x from a, a number, up to x, and I'm going to change x. What's the simplest a I could pick? So I don't really have to think, you know, too crazy about this. All right? What's a simple a I could pick to try to hopefully make this easier on myself? Well, one way to do this is zero. Let's let a be zero. So just off to the side here. I'm going to let a be zero for this first example because I want to just try to make as many things simple as I can while I'm understanding an idea. We are then going to let our upper bound change. And I'll kind of, you know, we'll do a couple example points so you can see what that looks like. And I'm going to integrate f of t again. This blue curve here is your f of t. So let's, you know, we've got the technology. Let's get fancy here. Right? We, we've got the tech. We can do it. Boom. Made that blue. Hold your pause. It's fine. It's excellent. So we've got g of x is integrate this function from 0, here 0, to some x value I give you. Because it's a function. I give you an x. You plug it into whatever you got to plug into. You spit out a number. That's what a function is. So that's what we need to be able to do with this. So I have down here a table. And what I want us to do is think through each of these. We're not going to do the calculation, just think through it. Okay. So if x is 0, 
what is g of 0? Well, let's use the formula. It'd be the integral from 0 to 0 of f of t dt. So, you know, what, what, what does that mean? Well, go up to the picture. Here's 0. And what's a nice way of thinking about this when you have the picture? Remember, the integral from a to b, we like to think of as area under the curve, right? That's one way we, we talked about integrals. They're they kind of adding they're adding up this area. We're gonna be a little careful positive negative, which we'll get to in this in, in a second. But you know, that's a general idea. So we're looking at this area under the curve. So what's this integral say? It says, give me the area under this curve from zero to zero. So I start at zero and I go travel to the upper bound here and I count up all the area. So here I go, ready? I'm at zero, I gotta get to zero. Did you miss it? I think you might have missed it. Let me do it again. Did you miss it again? Oh, I didn't go anywhere. You're right, I didn't go anywhere. It's zero to zero. I didn't move, so there is no area under this curve. So what did we just learn? This function I've created, when I plug zero in, I get zero. So I know a specific point on this curve g of x. I could draw it. It is 0, 0. Hits that point. And we're actually going to do this later. Is We are going to take a function f of t and try to construct this picture by just looking at this function. It's insane, I know, sounding, but we're going to do it. So this first point 0. Okay, well let's get to a not silly point. Let's plug in 1. So I want to know what in the world is g of 1? Well, plug it in. 0, now 1 goes up here. And let's see what this looks like. So I go back to the picture here. Okay, so here's 1. All right, what do I want? Remember, integral, area under the curve from 0 to 1. So I'm going to try my best to draw a nice vertical line here. Nailed it. And then I want all this area. So, you know, this isn't set up super nicely to, to kind of figure out what this is just looking at it because it's a curve, not a straight line. There's no geometric shape we could really use here. So, um, you know, that's a little tough, but we can learn about it, right? We can think through this. First things first, what can I say about this? This area is above the axis. So I know g of 1 is a positive number. I know it's bigger than zero because there's some area. I know it's a positive number. Okay. What else could you say? I mean, you know, this is not something you necessarily have to go too crazy with, but you should always be just stopping and thinking about what you're seeing, just as much as you can say. So what's another thing I could say? Well, check this out. This is a one by one box. See how it's one with one height. Not to scale, but it's still a one by one box. The area of this box is one. Guess to me, it kind of looks like maybe I take up about half of the area of the box. So just guesstimating, it looks like from this picture, just a, again a guesstimation, we can actually do the calculation. A guesstimation, it looks like this is. Let's see here. It looks like g of 1 is about a half, right? So, Because it looks like maybe that, that purple shaded curve fits in about half that box. OK, so all right, great. So we think it's about 1, all right? We're going to go over to Mathematica and actually calculate these in a second using the integral. Because we, we actually haven't talked about like how do I actually integrate this thing. So don't worry about that right now. All right, but then, you know, let's think about g of 2. So let's check out g of 2. And just, again, we're just trying to think through. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 of our function above, f of t dt. So let's go check it out. All right, so, you know, let's, let's change up the color uh, a minute. Let's maybe go green here. So again, I want to start at 0, okay? And then I want to go out to 2. So I want all the area under this curve. So, ooh, what's happening here? I get the purple, 
but then I also get so how do we want to do this well we'll do all of this area in green so green 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 all of this is green but then I also pick up all of this green Ooh. okay so this is now g of 2 is all of this green so we gotta be careful right because remember when we think of these as areas if the area is up here above the axis it's positive if the area that we're calculating is down here it actually counts as negative so what we have to think through is like okay well what is g of 2 gonna be it's gonna be this green and then that's all positive this area and then we're gonna take away this green so oh goodness like what is that gonna be exactly that's a little tough to say but just eyeballing it it does seem like this green area that's negative that's being taken away is smaller than this so just kind of checking this out I do think g of 2 will be a negative number but it's quite hard with this to actually tell exactly what it's gonna be right so this is is pretty tough I don't you maybe you want to go give it a guess at what this is but at least I know it's positive right just because this negative area is smaller than this one you could take a couple guesses to to say to yourself like ooh, do I think when I take this whole green and subtract this is this gonna be bigger or smaller than the purple I think it's a little tough to say but you know you could take a couple you could take a, a stab at that see if you can figure it out but we're just gonna go to Mathematica because this functions a little tough and, and have it calculate for us so you know, we're not really sure how to compare it to one half but that's the process that's it you give me an X all I do is I start at my a which is zero in this case every time see how I started at zero every time for these that that a doesn't change in a problem it just gets fixed that's your always your start point then you give me the X I plug it up here and that's where I go to zero one two I could go out further I could go the other way too I could go to negative one to negative two and, and we could do that as well we'd have to think through it a little bit but we can do it and so that's it that's the process that you know that that's that's how you would construct the values of G okay what we're gonna do in a little bit is we're gonna go a little deeper and say oh yeah that's cool and all but uh, you know it, it's especially with these functions that are a little tougher it's not really you know very rigorous like can I can I get do a little bit better here like you know how do I learn more about G G is a function so think back to calc 1 what what can we learn about G we can learn where it's positive where it's negative uh, where it's concave up where it's concave down where are the local maximums you know all of that kind of stuff we could learn about a function just using derivatives G is a function so I should be able to learn all those things just by looking at derivatives we're gonna be able to do that but first we need to start with how do I even calculate g of 0 g of 1 g of 2 I look at areas under this curve f of t here so you know that and that's that's one section of problems I'm gonna have you do some practice on which you'll see down here skip down this for just a second so here is a, a, a very typical type of example uh, to try to use, okay? So I've given you a function f, right? Here's its graph, right? I'm asking you find values of g. Remember, what is g? g is the function defined by taking this graph and finding areas under the curve. Remember, g is the antiderivative. f is the derivative. Just keep, I'm going to keep saying that over and over again here, right? this is the anti derivative and this is the derivative so we just have to keep reminding ourselves that if I take the derivative of g of x I get f of x okay that's a very important piece right go back up to the theorem keep going back up to the theorem remind yourself g prime of x is f of x this is not written here just for fun it's it's a useful thing to be reminding we're getting this is critical to keep reminding yourself of okay this connection Okay, so, all right, how do I do something like this? Well, it's just like we did before, right? So there's a solution down there that, you you know, we'll look through, but just kind of quickly to do one together. Uh, let me switch back to purple here. So 
it says find G0, G1, G2, G3, G4, G5, and then sketch a rough graph of G, which we'll do together. So G of 0. Well, how do I do that? Well, just plug into the integral. That's always your first step, especially when you're for first kind of feeling this out. So it's the area between 0 and let me go to 0. Insert the joke about you missing it again. 0. OK. So what do I know? I know when I plug 0 into this function g, I get 0 out. So you know you actually could just kind of immediately start this off, right? Let's draw this out. Let's go x, uh, and then here we're going to draw out you know this g of x here. Okay, so zero zero, boom, right? Because when I plug zero and I get zero. All right. So I'll call this y equals g of x. So okay, what about g of one? Well. Just plug it into the integral, add up all the area from 0 to 1. Okay, so let's do it. Here's 1. Oh, okay, so, you know, I get a little triangle here. That's pretty neat. So I know how to calculate the area of a triangle. It's 1 half base, see the width of 1 here, base, times height, 2. So there you go. The area of this triangle is 1. So that, what does that mean? When I plug in the number 1, I get up to 1 here. So my function g starts here, hits here. Okay. So that, that's g of 1 is 1. So I know that those are two points. All right. g of 2, let's do that one. Again, 0 to 2, f of t dt. So let's do this in, let's do a light blue here. Oh, light blue is, that's silly. That's the color of the function. So okay, so this g of two now, go here. So I want the area from zero to two, okay? So that means I get the purple plus I get this new stuff. So this new area, plus what I've already done. Because remember, it's 0 to 2. So one way that's really nice to do this, that's kind of neat, is if you think about this, g of 2 is really g of 1 plus this extra green. So let me write that out. g of 2 is equal to g of 1 plus this extra green shaded region that's in the picture. So this is kind of neat because because you already know g of 1 is 1. So OK, great. This area was 1. So all we have to do is figure out this area here. Well, this is a rectangle. Base 1, height 2. So this is area 2. So then this is going to be 1 from g of 1 plus 2 from that green shaded region. All right, so let's draw that on here. When I go to 2 now, I get 3. One, two, three. So we'll put that as our, our little green dot. There we go. All right. And then, and then we just keep going and we can kind of see what happens here. So when I go now and do g of 3, right, I insert, we can do that in um, maybe like a, a little red. This doesn't really look red to me, but maybe it'll be different in the video. G of 3, I guess that's red, is the integral from 0 to 3 of f of t dt. So let's look at g of 3 now. So this is the area under the curve from 0 to 3 of the function f of t. Right? So we already actually have some of this done. So really all we need to add to this is just this area here between 2 and 3. Right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take g of 2 and add in this extra area. So then let me just write that out and I'll, I'll try to color code this too. So this is going to be equal to g of 2, okay, and then plus this extra area here that we need to we need to grab colored in. 
Now, in this problem, this function is, is, you know, who knows, maybe it looks like it's a cubic or something like that. And it, from a picture like this, it's, it's difficult to see, right? So let me just zoom in here so we can even see a little bit better exactly what's happening with this function. Well, that was not the zoom I wanted. There we go. So it's got this curve to it, so we're just going to approximate it with a triangle. You know, it's this is not about being super um, uh, precise here. We're just going to, you know, try approximating with a triangle here. So actually it's going to be the same as this triangle, kind of cutting here, height 2, base 1. And so that will have an area of 1. So that'll be 1. What was g of 2? g of 2 was 3. So all together, this is going to be, that's a 3. We'll say that g of 3 is approximately 4. Okay, so if we went up one more here on our little picture that we threw together, once we hit 3 now, we're up here at about 4, and that's where our picture will go, or our little point will go. So we're up here at 4. Okay, not too bad. Now here's where the interesting stuff happens. Not that that wasn't interesting, but, you know. So when we now go to 4, g of 4, it's going to get a little weird because we are now adding in this negative area, okay? And so, negative area, what does that mean? Well, so we, we can still think of this as area under the curve, but since it's below the axis, remember that accumulates as a negative. So we still, to calculate it, g of four, we wanna just plug into the formula, zero to four, f of t, dt, okay? But remember, we've already, this is an accumulation, so we've already accumulated this first chunk of area. So this is going to be approximately, and I'm just bringing this 4 down here, we'll even keep color coding it, it's going to be about 4 here, and then we're going to have minus the shaded area here. Again, minus because it's below the axis. And so again, this is curved, so we're not really sure exactly what it is. And we could probably figure out what this formula might be um, or something close to it. But we're just going to use a triangle again here just to see. So using a triangle here, it's the same as this one. It's got 2 as the height, 1 as the base. So we'll just call that minus 1. So minus 1. And that's going to again be about 3. Okay, so that's g of 4. So it's gone down now, and let's color that in over here, back down to three. So kind of looking through this, you know, we're, we're gonna go back and forth the connection between these two graphs in a second. We'll finish G of five and then we'll, we'll get there. So G of five, uh, let's see, I might be running out of colors here. Uh, let's see, we could do gray. J, J, G of five, is the integral from 0 to 5 f of t dt, which is just, again, accumulating all this area, or the negative, uh, but then adding this extra bit. So we're going to then end up with 3 from the previous. All right, it's going to be equal to 3 from the previous. And then again, it's, it's going to be this minus this gray shaded area, which, looking at it again, about 1 again. Well, you know, we're not 100% we're not here, but as an approximation, this should be fine. And so I should say approximately. Okay, and so that's going to be equal to that, which is equal to 2. And so if I went out to 5, I'd be at about here. Okay, so see my points. All right, so kind of some of the connections we should make here. Remember, this is a graph of the derivative. 
this is a graph of the function. So a couple things we got to remember from Calc 1. When the derivative is positive, the value of the derivative is positive. See how this whole blue is above the axis? That's positive. What does that mean? That means that the function's increasing. So watch this. This is positive right after 0 up until 3. Watch what's happening to the function. Increasing, increasing, increasing. Hits 3. Okay, then what happens? Well, the derivative is negative, so I should be going down again. Boom. So that, that connection that we learned in Calc 1 between a function and its derivative still applies here. Massively important to remember. Function, derivative. What's the derivative tell you about the function? What's the second derivative tell you about the function? Okay, so we got to try to remember how that works. But there you go. Not too bad to try to, to, try to do that out. Okay, let's zoom back out now. Got a little solution here. You can kind of see how they did that. All right, next example. So this example is using the other part of the fundamental theorem. And that other part is specifically trying to calculate the derivative. Now, what do we just see here? You got to think about what I just said with this one. See how we define this. g of x is the integral from 0 to x of f of t. This f of t is the derivative of g of x. So, okay, hold that in your head. Let's go back down here. This f of t is the derivative of g of x. All right, I'm pausing for dramatic effect. So let's see if the effect has taken hold. Okay, so g of x is equal to the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt, but that's t squared dt. So find a formula for g of x and calculate g prime of x. Okay. Well, let's actually just start with g prime of x. g prime, what's the derivative of this function? Sitting right here. Hmm, okay. So are you telling me it's just t squared? Well, this is a function of x, so we use x. But yep, that's it. Done. That's the derivative. Okay. But we can, you know, we can actually also do this integral using the evaluation theorem here, which it shows. And we just have to remember that we're looking for the antiderivative. So to actually compute this integral, right, this step they take here is the antiderivative. Right, we're comfortable with derivatives. t cubed, how do I take the derivative of this? Right, I drop the 3 down, becomes a 2. Okay, cancels with the 3, I get t squared. So remember, derivative, antiderivative just go the other way. So they do that. They take the antiderivative, bring us back here. Then remember, you plug the bounds in. So x cubed over 3 minus 1 cubed over 3. That's how they got here. They just smushed it into one fraction. So I'll write that out for you. x cubed over 3 minus 1 cubed over 3. Same thing. Okay. All right. So then this is your g of x. That's the formula, closed form formula, for this function defined by an integral. Sometimes it just has a nice formula, and we can calculate that. All right. What's the derivative? Well, the derivative of this is x squared. I told you that. Because when I define a function this way, from a to x, this is important, then this inside function is just the derivative. That's pretty much the whole point of setting it up this way. We are using the integral to accumulate this change. You think of derivative as change. So this is changing, and we're accumulating. We're, we're grabbing all of the change. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, but we're grabbing it all, grabbing it all, grabbing it all. We're accumulating it, and then that's going to help us find this g of x. So there you go. So the, the derivative of this, not too bad. Okay, so let's go back to our example of sine pi t squared over 2. All right. So remember how we had set this up before. We have a function, g of x which was the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt, okay, where f is this function, which is graphed below. 
And so we might want to ask the question, well, where is based on this? Where's G going up? When's it going down? When's it concave up? When's it concave down? And so what you need to do is remind yourself of the connection, right? And it's okay to just keep writing this out for yourself however you need to do it, right? So let's see here. So remember the general connection here, although I'm going to write it in terms of these functions, right? G of X is increasing when its derivative, G prime of X, is positive. So that's the connection there g of x is decreasing when its derivative is negative. But remember, this is f, right? The function f is actually the derivative. So what we really need to be doing is looking at this picture. If we want to know what g is doing, increase, decrease, we just need to look where is it positive and where is it negative. And so you just, you know, just to kind of see this, well, let's just look at the picture. So the picture here, we're looking at this picture, and I'll just do a little shading. So oh, could I have picked a worse color for that? I think not. Let's pick pink here. Okay, I'm going to shade where, it, where G, the function's increasing. All of this, all of this, all the time here g the function g is increasing and not there but all of this in, i'm increasing if i'm g if i'm g i'm increasing not anymore and here i'm increasing i'm increasing i'm increasing i'm increasing i'm increasing so all this pink area i'm increasing and then on the other hand though i g the function g i'm going to be decreasing when this graph is negative has negative values, so that's down here and down here. Wee, not there. And here, woohoo! All of me, and then here. Okay, so g again. This is f, but the function g right here is increasing throughout this whole pink zone, and it's decreasing wherever I drew green. Amazing, we can get all that information just from that. Now, how would we actually kind of try to figure this out, you know, to be more specific? Because I just drew on this picture, I didn't actually tell you values, right? If we we're looking at this, this is saying I'm increasing from whatever that point is up to zero, and then also zero, not including zero, to whatever this point is. What the heck point is that, right? Well, this is our function, so let's rewrite it down below. Sine pi t squared over 2. So let's just rewrite this. What are we actually trying to do here? We'll start with increasing. We want to know when sine pi t squared over 2 is positive. That's what we're looking for here. Okay, and so, you know, it's okay. You got to write out. A little circle here remind yourself sine remember is positive between 0 right so it's actually um, sorry 0 at that point but not included 0 up to pi this whole range not including the two points 0 and pi we're going to be positive okay so but be careful here right that's just regular old sine Right, so sine of theta when is going to be positive when theta is between zero and pi. Okay, but we don't have theta, just a regular theta. We have pi t squared over two. So we need to figure out when that's happening. So just move some stuff around. Uh, multiply by two, divide by pi. That's going to give us zero less than t squared. And then that'll be 2 pi, but then you actually divided the pi just leaving 2. So that'll be 2 over there. Ran out of room, so that's okay. Then we're looking for all the t values between where, when you square them, you're between 0 and 2. Okay? 
So we have to think a little bit about what that means, right? So let's just take the kind of first approach at this, the kind of naive first thing, is you might just kind of try to square root this. So that would put you here. Okay, now we can think through what square root of two is, but what you'll end up noticing is that that puts you actually right about square root two right here. So, okay, zero to root two, boom, that's that one. Okay, but remember, this was like your, your and I'm not saying you specifically, you might not have fallen into this, but I, fall for this sometimes this like naive just do the square root and oh look at me right but then we also have to remember that you know you can't just square root a square every time and everything's golden right because also the way this works when we do this when we have this inequality is that t between zero and negative root two also works for this right that's why this one's all lit up okay so this is also true, right? This this little grouping, okay? And so then you know you you've got some more work to do because this repeats, right? Because it's zero to pi, I'm going to be positive if I'm sine. But then remember, this keeps happening, so it's boom zero to pi, and then I would be negative here on on sine. I'm negative for some of these sine values next, but then guess remember what happens look what happens I'm back positive because this axis here is me just going woo, 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 around the circle and so this function really goes forever I only decided to draw it from negative 2.5 to 2.5 as a t value but remember this keeps going 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 so that's just something to kind of try to you know keep in your mind a little bit when you're when you're going through here is that this function it's sine so it's going to continue to you know, run around the circle and copy and copy and copy, okay? So, you know, that's that first chunk here that we're looking for. So I'm doing this all by hand. Now, what actually happens when we go back around the circle? Because I, I want to do this one more time. So just to kind of show you what this looks like, and then we're going to do it in Mathematica so you can get a, a, a feeling for what it looks like to do it there. But this is also true, right? between 2 pi and 3 pi. So uh, also, sine theta is greater than 0, right? When theta is in between 2 pi and 3 pi. But remember, we have pi t squared over 2, right? Again, start stripping all this away. Right, you get a 4, the pi's cancel, so you're going to get 4 less than t squared less than 6. And then you're going to, maybe naively, but it's okay to just kind of off the bat square root just to, to see what should happen. So you're going to get 2 less than t less than root 6. Okay, and as you can see, look, perfect, 2, 2, I'm going to be increasing up to root 6. Now what's it, I you know what's pretty interesting here is you might have expected this range to have just kind of continued this this range of increasing the same thickness the same picture to kind of just keep going. But because of this square piece, right? As we move out in t's, the this the stretch of us increasing is actually getting smaller. So this is getting smaller, which is kind of cool, right? And so it's because of the square and having to do the square root, we're actually shrinking that, right? And so this might be something fun. You can go into Mathematica and try to stretch this out and see what happens to the function. We'll and then also flip this onto the other side, right? And, right, it's the same thing over here. It's going to be at negative 2, negative root 6 is that other positive. So that's those two. So each time I try to solve this, each half circle I run gives me a positive and a negative range of increasing. So this was a half circle, and this was that same half circle. 
0 to pi. Then this was 2 pi to 3 pi, but so was this. Okay, and so, you know, let's, let's get rid of this because we need a lot more space. When are we increasing, decreasing to be more specific? I mean, this is a little bit harder to kind of just do out, but what we can do is on the range negative 2.5 to 2.5. We're just going to stick here. G of x was increasing. So G of x is increasing between 0, 0 and root 2, between negative root 2 and 0, also between 2 and root 6, and also between uh, negative root 6 and negative 2. So it's all of those places it's increasing. And so it's just going to be decreasing everywhere else. So this is kind of nice to do. You can just you know, go everywhere else to see decreasing. This one would be root 2 to 2, union. And then let's see, this is going to be, here was root 6 root 6 and then we just stopped at 2.5 although of course this this function keeps going forever so we could keep figuring out what this looks like but we'll just stop there but then on the left what happened it was between negative root 2 and negative 2 negative root 2 and negative 2 and then also what was this other one negative root 6 and negative 2.5. Okay. Boom. And then pew, to the end. So there you go. Intervals of inc increase, decrease. All right. So the last thing in this section is talking about some more general scenarios with uh, these functions. Because you don't just have to have an x here right you can have any you know almost anything you want so what about this function h of x is defined to be the integral from 0 to x squared not just x now of this derivative function you can almost kind of think of it all right so fundamental theorem well the fundamental theorem if you're just trying to blindly use it just makes you think that this should just be oh this is easy right Woohoo, look at me go. I'll just plug in an x. Hooray! Now this is wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because we're thinking about the function wrong. So I'm going to have you rewrite this and I think about this in a different way. h of x is really the combination of two functions. So let me give you, give you an idea of what I'm, th I'm thinking here. g of x I'm going to define as this function. And you're about to just look at me and be like, what the heck are you doing? But think about this for a second. g of x is the integral of the same inside from 0 to x. So what's g prime? Well, the fundamental theorem just immediately applied tells us it's this. So OK, sweet. But h of x then would be g of x squared. See how I'm now writing this as a composition? This x squared would get plugged in, go up top, and boom, that's h of x. So, okay, what's the derivative then? Well, the derivative of h, of h, h prime, this is chain rule, right? This is equal to g prime of x squared times the derivative of x squared. But I know g prime. Right? Fundamental theorem tells me it's this. So that's 1 plus. Now instead of x cubed, right, I don't plug in x. I plug in this x squared. Boom. Times 2x. Which, of course, you can, you know, rearrange if you want. Try to write it a little bit nicer. There you go. That's my derivative. So chain rule big important piece. If you see this is not just x, you're going to use the chain rule. But if you think of h as a composition of functions, then it's really not too bad to kind of go through this chain rule. So let's try another one. So two messed up things here. Not only is this not just an x, but 
it's also on the bottom. That has a pretty quick fix though, because, right, because when going through here, you just gotta remember, I can rewrite this integral by putting a negative sign in front. I can flip, boom, easy peasy. So okay, and now that gets me into the piece above. So the piece above, remember, y is equal to g of e to the x, where g of x, is, and you can call this whatever you want, I just picked g for Gary, I guess, g of x is the integral, right, so I should put a negative in here, 0 to x sine cubed t dt, which the fundamental theorem tells us because it's in the right form, that's going to be negative sine cubed x. Right, because the fundamental theorem tells me just immediately, just plug the x in, you're all done. So y prime will be g prime of e to the x times, what's the derivative of e to the x? Because again, chain rule, chain rule, that's e to the x. Okay, so g prime is negative sine cubed, but I don't plug x in, right? I plug e to the x times e to the x. Ta-da! These really aren't very bad. You just have to look at the problem and approach it as like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Like I've said in other, other videos, other things before, or I will say in the future, all of these problems that look more complicated, right, are just easier problems lumped together. So you've got to start approaching these as how do I simplify this into an easier problem? Maybe a couple small easier problems. And what you notice is, once you've, you've kind of seen the tricks of this, you can swap these with a negative, and then, oh yeah, this is just one easy function, which just immediately I can get the derivative of using um, the fundamental theorem, and it's composed with e to the x, which is actually also another easy function. Now I've got that, I just apply the chain rule, and I'm all done.